So you have been working with sculpted prints for a while, but still wonder why your methods sometimes work and sometimes fail. You wonder what is right and what is wrong about all of this. In this tutorial I want to let you look behind the curtains and explain what a sculpt map really is, and how it works in detail, and what you actually can do with sculpted prints, and what you can never do with them. Hello and welcome. Let me show you the most basic sculpted print first, a simple plain surface. This surface has two dimensions which we will call X and Y, and the surface is made out of rectangular faces. These faces are also called quads. This special surface here is actually made out of 32 faces along X and 32 faces along Y. Hence the total number of faces for this surface is 32 times 32, so it has 1024 faces. A closer inspection shows that each face of this mesh is made out of four vertices and four edges. Each two adjacent faces share one edge and two vertices. This very specific arrangement is the most simple and the most regular mesh that you can define on a surface. As a matter of fact, exactly this mesh topology is used by all sculpted prints in the world. And because the mesh topology is predefined, we only need to specify an enumerated list of points in 3D space. And because the mesh is strictly rectangular, we can use the vertex row and the vertex column as list indexes. We will talk about the implications of this in a few moments. As an example, the bottom left point could be addressed by the value 0, dot, 0. This means that it is located in the first row counting from bottom up, and in the first column counting from left to right. This enumeration is universal. That means, as long as you keep the mesh topology intact, you can rearrange the vertices as much as you like, and you can bend and stretch the mesh within all three dimensions. As long as the connecting edges are not changed and, as long as you do not add new vertices to the mesh or remove existing vertices from it, the object can always be transformed into a sculpted print. With other words, the bottom left vertex of the original surface will always be vertex number 0.0, .0 even if it has been moved to the top right position of the mesh, and this works as long as the edges are not removed. And in very clear words, when you cut or rearrange the edges, then the object is no longer a sculpted prime. Okay, we have now learned that each mesh is made out of a set of adjacent faces, arranged in a number of rows and columns. The default sculpted print contains 32 rows, with 32 faces on each row. And how the mesh is woven, is strictly defined and stored in a separate map. There is an unchangeable one-to-one -one relationship between the vertices on the map and the vertices on the mesh. It is convention that the horizontal axis on the map is named U, and the vertical axis is named V. The map itself is called UV map. While you can move the vertices around on the mesh to whichever location you like, the UV map always remains constant. So, even if you change your mesh to a true three-dimensional surface, the UV map does not change, and each vertex on the mesh can always be located on the UV map. Let us proceed now by creating a basic cylinder. We simply bend the plane along a full circle of 360 degrees. Now this is interesting, after bending it, the plane touches itself along one entire side. In other words, some of the vertices share the exact same location. And so we have introduced our first scene here. Let us take a look at the UV map. Indeed we see that the entire leftmost column of vertices and the corresponding rightmost column both match up. We now can stitch the plane along the scene. 
In principle this is done by merging the vertices from the leftmost side with those from the rightmost side of the UV map. In fact this removal of vertices does not change the UV map significantly. We only have forced the model to always use the same locations for the rightmost column and the leftmost column of the UV map, and this is called a cylinder stitching. When we now select one single vertex along the seam, we actually have selected two separate entry points within the UV map. In fact the color representation of this mesh does not change at all after we stitch the seam. However, when we transfer this mesh to Second Life, we have the option to set the stitching type to cylinder in accordance to the mesh topology. Let us go on with our cylinder now, and let us bend it to the form of a torus like I show you here. Well, somehow we expected this to happen. Now the topmost and bottommost row match up and can be stitched just like we did for the cylinder a few moments ago. And by now, the torus is ready to use, and we must not forget to set the stitching type after importing it to Second Life. Let us go back to our cylinder. And let us close the top and bottom by collapsing the top row and the bottom row of vertices into single poles. Then let us deform it to a spherical shape. And finally the sculpty sphere is created. Until here I have introduced the basics of sculpted prints. Starting with a simple surface, I have shown you how you can derive a cylinder, a torus, and a sphere. I also have shown you that the basic layout of the mesh, namely the UV map, remains the same for all sculpted prints in the world, regardless of their shape. Now you may ask yourself, how can the UV map be constant and still contain the mesh data of my sculpties? Apparently, the mesh differs from object to object. So where in the UV map can I find the location information for all the faces of my object? The answer is simple. The UV map does not contain this information. The data is stored in another construct, namely the sculpt map. And that is simply a two-dimensional image. So when we look in more detail to our UV map, we see that it is indeed associated to an image. And currently this image is entirely black. We will store the location of each vertex of the mesh into exactly one corresponding pixel of the scalp map. And the exact mapping between vertices on the mesh and pixels on the scalp map is defined by the UV map. In Blender we can create the sculpt map by using the Print Star Baker which generates the pixel data for us. I will explain in the next tutorial how a vertex location corresponds to the pixel color, but for now we only need to remember that each vertex on the mesh is stored in one pixel on the image. Now look at the image size. We see 64 pixels in X and 64 pixels in Y. Why that? We only have to provide 33 times 33 pixels to store the mesh. So in principle we can provide an image of that size and we are done. But the height and the width of any sculpt map must be in a set of power of two numbers. We only can use either 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, or 512 pixels per side. Any other size is not supported and it will be scaled to the nearest power of 2 number. So, the smallest possible image size we can use to store 33 times 33 vertex locations is a 64 times 64 pixel image. And this implies that we only use 1089 of the provided 4096 pixels to store our sculpt map. It is clearly defined where the important pixels are placed on the map. 
they are located on each second row and on each second column counting from the bottom left edge of the image. All pixels which I have colorized in black are not used for this particular map. You see that only one out of four pixels is actually used. The entire rest of the map is wasted space. Note that this pattern is broken at the topmost row and on the rightmost column. That is where the 33rd pixel row and pixel column are stored. And finally you should always remember that the number of vertices provided for a particular UV map is constant and cannot be changed. Hence a sculpt map of size 64 x 64 pixels can store exactly 1089 vertices, which translates to 1024 faces. And every map must provide the vertex data in exactly the marked pixels. And even if the map has enough place to store 3007 more vertices within the black parts of the map, that does not work with sculpted prints because the pixels which are marked in black are never used. Sculpted prints are not limited to square meshes and square UV maps. You can use any combination of power of two values for U faces and V faces, as long as U faces times V faces remains less or equal to 1024. Also you may not have less than four faces on each side of the mesh, You can calculate the pixel size of a scalp myth by taking the product of faces in width and height times 4. This is not always true, but it works for most ratios. You can have extreme meshes up to the size of 4 times 256 faces. And the smallest supported scalp myth size is an image with 4 times 4 faces. From what we learned a minute ago, the scalp map of this object has a size of 8 times 8 pixels. That is a perfectly valid sculpted frame, and it can be uploaded to Second Life without problems, as long as you use any version of the view or two. I am now at the end of this tutorial. We have introduced the UV map and the sculpt map, and how these maps relate to meshes and sculpted prints. Next time we will continue with the working example and show how the principles of sculpted frames can be used in practice. See you later!